I don't think about being a man or a woman. I don't think about anything, really. Most of what's on the media and out there about transgender people isn't, you know, necessarily the only presentation of transgender people. And then musically, I just, you know, I hope that they can see, you know, the depth of my lyrics and what I'm trying to say. I was uh, born Wayne George Mahler in uh, 1953 in Baltimore, Maryland. I'd say I had a pretty idyllic childhood, uh, you know, except for dealing with the transgender stuff, which I was dealing with myself the best that I could. Uh, as early as four years old, I knew that, that there was something wrong, you know, if wrong's the right word. I started writing when I was in elementary school, actually. Um, you know, real simple songs. Um, of course, some of them were about um, girls that I was attracted to in elementary school and, you know, love stories and that kind of thing. Real simplistic stuff. I first met Wayne George Mahler. Uh, 1972, I'd say it was. Uh, I was playing in a local group and uh, the uh, leader of the group had told me that we were going up to our local high school there and that they were putting on a musical. And uh, George and another friend of his had written the music for it and they wanted us to perform the music. Keith McNamee was a bass player when I was in junior high and he was playing in a lot of uh, popular bands during the high school period. And um, I used to see, when I did get into high school, I used to see him walking down the hall and he was a heavyset white guy and he had an afro that was like out to here and it wasn't permed, it was natural. And uh, he was just about the wildest guy, you know, that you'd ever want to meet. I liked, uh, I liked the music that he was playing at that time, the originals that uh, he was doing that they were for the play, but still I could, I don't know, there was just a sense about him that I said, you know, this guy's got talent. He was putting together a group and he asked me if I would be interested in coming down to play with him. So I came over to his house and uh, he had a couple of people and I had some of my own friends that I wanted to bring into the group. So uh, at that point, uh, we sort of like merged together and uh, we started playing music. At the time, uh, Stephen Stills had a band called Manassas. And so we figured if he could name a band after a town, so could we, so we called it Jessup. Wayne, I could tell at that time where George was not really too happy with doing cover material. And he had formed another group on the side that was basically doing a lot of original music.
But uh, I could tell that there was a, uh, a, a feeling that he wanted to go out and do his own thing and do his own music. So uh, and I respected that. Uh, we tried to do a couple of the songs, but we were basically a top 40 cover band. I went to California like a lot of young people do because they think that's the place to make it. We went out there to try and see if we could get in the door somewhere. Be rock stars. I was proud of some of the things that we accomplished considering what we knew about what we were doing. We got on a show called Dick Whittington Show, which was a morning talk show, more or less. But the guy was one of the most widely listened to DJs in the morning, and I used to drive a delivery truck out there um, and, and used to listen to him in the morning, and I took a... Uh, 45 that uh, two fellows had produced a 45 uh, one song I wrote back in Baltimore and the other song was written by this singer friend of mine uh, Tim and we recorded them uh, with at the two producers expenses and we took it out to uh, to Dick Whittington and um, he agreed to play it and then he invited us on to the show and I think the drummer in that band and myself were the only ones that would get up and go to the show. And the rest of the guys didn't do anything, and the writing was kind of like on the wall at that point. The group split up, and everybody went their way. I, I came back, uh, I don't know, six months after the singer came back, and I put together a group called Georgie Jessup and the Jewels, and, the, and the, uh, that's where Georgie Jessup first originated from and Mac is the one that came up with that name because George was my middle name, given middle name and he used to hear my father when he'd come home from work and you know if I was down there he'd say Georgie or whatever refer to me as Georgie and so Mac came up with George E. Jessup and the Jewels and I, you know I was really into like the retro uh, R&B was going on at the Blues Brothers had been out and, or had just come out and, um, you know I was doing a lot of the old Wilson Pickett and Otis Redding and Aretha Franklin and all those kinds of songs and along with my originals and so that was the first band that I fronted that I actually I actually got a keyboard player and had a keyboard player so I could just sing and we played around for a couple of years and uh, then using that same name, I hooked up with Mac again and uh, a couple guys that um, Mac knew. And uh, we did a demo of five songs for a songwriting, uh, not a songwriting, but a band contest. And uh, we actually came in second. From that point on, you know, we were in and out of groups together over the next, I don't know, 20 or 30 years probably. But uh, one group that uh, we really uh, enjoyed doing was uh, Wavelength. And that was a group that uh, mainly did uh, top 40 rhythm and blues rock. But we also did a lot of George's originals. 
I told you it was an excellent week ahead, and I promised you some excellent music tonight, and you are about to get it. A stellar band whose music has been called American Rock and Roll, like Bruce Springsteen or Bob Seger. Ladies and gentlemen, the original sounds of Wavelength. some tasty music thank you ladies and gentlemen of wavelength and if you'd like to see them live and i'm sure that the experience is doubly good you know he's one of my oldest and dearest friends and, you know he was the first person i really really told about my gender issues and he really thought that i knew about it and i was completely blown away because i had no idea i mean here's a cat that uh Many times we were playing, he was the one that would get all the girls, you know, in the band. He was the, uh, the, uh, the focal point of the band. I think a lot of people just thought it was a phase in me, and, you know, I may have even, you know, I didn't know where it was going to go. I didn't know whether it was, you know, just some kind of fetish thing that was in my life that I had to deal with on that level, and, you know, like some people were into whips and chains and, you know, things like that, or, or you know, what it was. Everything's kind of like a, you know, everything's kind of jammed together because when I move on from something, 
I just move on from it. And like people talk, like old high school friends get together and talk about how, you know, we all oh, remember when we used to do this. Well, ten, nine times out of ten, I don't. You know, I live in the moment, in that moment. So it's hard for me to retain a lot of details. But I do know that there's photos of me where you can see breast growth uh, when I was still with Wavelength. I've known Georgie, well, I met Georgie as Wayne in uh, 1981, November of that year. Um, the music always has been his life. That's, that's what drives, that's what drove Wayne. That, what, that is also what drives Georgie. That's the constant um, in Georgie's life. It's, That's it, really, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. You pick your battles, and that's the one he picked. So. When my wife left me um, and threw in the towel, <laughs> if you will, um, when that split up occurred, about two weeks later, the band Wavelamp split up. That was pretty much certainly one of the worst times in my life that I've ever had. I think I would have to say it was the worst time in my life because, uh, you know, I lost my wife, who I was really in love with. transgender people when they get in a crisis situation like that they do what's called purging and so you get rid of all these nice clothes that you've acquired over a period of time because you're not going to do this anymore and you're going to make your marriage work and you're going to be a good uh, heterosexual husband for your wife and so um, I went through that period, which was really hard on myself, and, and, and uh, uh, 
hard on for me to concentrate on anything else. And um, of course, losing the band, I you know I didn't. It was a really good band, and and I didn't even see it coming. George didn't really, in wavelength, didn't really change that much in his appearance. Even though we all knew about it, it was still something that he had in the closet. But no, that wasn't anything, I don't think anybody held that against him as far as that goes in the band. I mean, they might not have been happy with it, probably thought he was a little strange, but to this day, you can ask every one of those guys and they'll say, he's still a damn good songwriter. I didn't tell any members of my family until after my wife left me. Of course, I was very depressed about that, and, you know, they were encouraging me, and frankly, they really loved my ex-wife a lot and uh, couldn't understand it, why she would just leave me, and, you know, it was becoming her fault, and I could not just sit by and watch them blame her when I knew the reasons that we had split up were directly from me. And so that's when I, you know, I told them. They didn't get all emotional. Um, you know, they, I told them I was in therapy and they knew that. And, uh, uh, they just basically, their comment was that they, you know, they didn't really understand it and they couldn't imagine why I feel that way or how I feel that way. And, um, you know, I, of course, didn't know really what to tell them myself. And, um, but they didn't jump up and down and get crazy or anything, but it, wa it wasn't until later that there was a little bit of tension between my father and I over the issue. The fact that, uh, uh, my body was changing never really came up as a, a as an issue because you know again with having compassion for my family they knew about me they knew the story i wasn't going to walk around you know in a in a you know bathing suit in front of them to shove it down their throats so when i was around my family i mean i like wearing overalls obviously or i wouldn't be wearing them um, but when I was around my family, I would wear something like this because it, you know, covered up my breasts. It didn't have to be, you know, we could focus on the family and not on that issue. They already knew about the issue. There was no reason to force it on them. And I think a lot of transgender people do that. They just try to force it on everybody and shove it down your throat. And, you know, it's, I'm a songwriter who happens to be a transsexual. That's all I am. And, you know, it shouldn't really be an issue. I know that it is. We're talking about it, you know. So it's, it's, it's an issue that people have curiosity, and why shouldn't they? They don't understand it. But when we say to them, we don't understand it any more than you do, we're in the same boat as you. So now, instead of us being separated, we're together. And that's where understanding can start. Because believe me, I would have not given up being Wayne George Mahler if I hadn't, you know, if I didn't have to do it. If, if it wasn't a matter of survival, I would have never taken that route. And I had kept going through all this period, you know, playing my music. And I had finally, around 88, uh, that's when I actually transitioned in the music world. And uh, I formed this band called Winte and Crazy Sacred Dogs. Oh, a Winte is very hard to define in terms of Euro-American culture because when all that started coming out um, and there was a kind of a move in the GBLT community, more the GBL, uh, community, gay, lesbian, bisexual community, which more just gay, lesbian. It's so hard to put what a Wente is into terms that we can understand. They were people, uh, as far as I know, it was a term for male-bodied individuals who, because of a dream or a vision or their own, you know, their, their calling, if you will, um, they were commanded to basically, you know, live their life as a third gender. 
And uh, if, you know, if, like in the sense of a, being a man, then obviously they wore female clothing and often did a lot of female uh, craft work and things along that line. You know, the latitude that we have as a European culture um, on, a, on a material level is huge. But the latitude that we have on a spiritual level is very narrow. And it's almost the exact opposite in what I understand as traditional Native American cultures in that they had a wide latitude on a spiritual plane. So you were, if your dream said you were Wente, that's what you were, you know? And if you had been Chief Tomahawk, the day before and you had your vision and now you were Little Butterfly, then that's who you were. You were Little Butterfly and nobody questioned it because it came from the spirit. It came from Creator. So it's to talk about them in the same terms and say what is. If you talk to traditional gay people, a Wente is a gay person. If you talk to transgender people, a Wente is a transgender person. The reality for me is that it's the only thing that makes sense for who I am and what I am, and I identified with it on that level. And I don't really see it as a sexual issue whatsoever. I don't think it has anything to do with who you choose to sleep with, not sleep with, or sleep with at all. I'm transgender myself. I do it to my people. Uh, and they call me a wing tay. A wing tay for the Native American people is a very special person. They're usually their spiritual leaders. Uh, they take care of a lot of the families. Uh, they take care of the children and teach the children. Uh, they believe we're that way because of the fact that we have both male and female knowledge. And so that gives us a lot better view of, of the world and how things are put together. Um, and Georgie's not afraid of saying that. Nothing is black or white when you take your first breath. If you're searching for the new frontier, you can't go west. You see the faces in a land filled with bones. If you're searching for the new frontier, you can't go west. See the faces in a land filled with bones. This dream's gone crazy, but this is not a home. In the
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. American Holocaust was a really hard album for me to do because I had formed a band called Wente and Crazy Sacred Dogs when I transitioned and I was writing songs like Post Stop Freeway and It Ain't Easy for a Girl to Look Good and uh, you know, um, Human Race uh, and, and Drag City was another song that I had written and all these songs were really addressing my experience as a, as a transsexual woman in white America. I was in that mode, I, my heart was in that place, and all these songs that I had written about Native America were songs that I had written prior to that point in my life. And so I had to go back and kind of sing these songs that were like, really like typical angry young man songs, you know. She expected the album American Holocaust to explode, that everybody would be ready to receive the message and it would catapult Georgie into uh, quite a bit of uh, acclaim past this mid-Atlantic region. And her whole strategy was based on that. Of course, that didn't happen. In fact, we ran into a lot of prejudice, not only because of Georgie's uh, changing sexual appearance, but because the title of the song. Uh, or of the album, we had a lot of uh, music directors and station managers uh, at the time I was helping promote the album. And I would take it around to stations and station managers would say, you have no right to that title, American Holocaust. Uh, that's a, a word reserved for the Jews. And I asked each person that presented that, I asked them if they'd heard the album yet, and they always would say no. And I'd say, well, listen to the album, and if you still think that uh, the Native Americans don't have the right to use the word Holocaust, or if you think Georgie Jessup used that term in any way that uh, takes lightly the situation the Jews went through, then I won't come back and bother you again. Uh, my name is uh, Snow Owl. Uh, I'm a Missisqua Abenaki Indian. And they came out of Vermont area. I'm Snow's wife. Uh, Georgie usually refers to me as Picosa. My given name is Heidi. And my ancestors are supposedly Lakota, but I don't have any, you know, documentation or anything to, to prove that, um, but because I live in an Abenaki lodge and I'm married to an Abenaki man, I follow Eastern Woodlands traditions, and uh, I do honor my ancestors in my dance, and then I wear a, you know, Western-style regalia, but um, all of my ceremony and the way that we raise our children on the, you know, Abenaki tradition, of which is Eastern Woodlands Indians. I think I met Georgie first. Um... We had gotten a phone call that uh, some people up in Pennsylvania who had a buffalo farm had gotten in rear with their taxes and uh, the government dancer was to sell the buffalo off and uh, pay the taxes. Uh, so everybody we could pull together, we went up and tried to do this uh, benefit powwow to save the herd for these people. and. Uh, Georgie was, uh, had volunteered her time, uh, and that's where we had our first meeting. Uh, she had just completed the uh, American Ho Holocaust album, and uh, I had never uh, heard anyone as, uh, as prolific as she was and seemed to uh, capture the essence of uh, how I felt as a Native American person and uh, the living in a, a dual world, uh, which uh, it, uh, I was very impressed with her. Yeah, you were. <laughs> we had uh, many um, ancestors that predicted that uh, the uh, 
people of any color would don the feather before uh, it was out, and this was part of a way of, uh, of bringing us all together as people and start thinking of ourselves as people and not, you know, individuals. And uh, that when something happens to uh, one group in the village, uh, it affects the other group. So. Uh, her heart is where uh, most Native heart is, and the words that she uses and the stories that she tells, she paints a great picture. I think that Georgie has every right um, to speak about, you know, Native issues, and, and genocide is an issue that affects everyone, not just Native Americans. They, you know, certainly practice genocide in Europe, you know, they practice genocide against people that they brought over from the continent of Africa. And again, I agree with Snow, genocide is a planetary problem. You know, it is not unique to one ethnic group. And until we start looking at ourselves as human beings, instead of Caucasians or Native Americans or African Americans or Egyptians or Ethiopians or whatever, we're all in trouble. You know, this is our planet and we have to live here. And I think that's really, I think Georgie tries to bring the events of genocide against the Native Americans to the, to the you know, forefront of people's minds as an example of what can happen when we don't you know, try to live on a, on a planetary scale and, and uh, you know, we single people out for their ethnic beliefs and, and their ethnic origins. Um, Georgie is one of the few people that I've encountered in my life, I won't say the few people that exist, that um, actually stands behind her convictions. That, that's very refreshing, um, especially in a society where people just don't seem to care about anything anymore. The apathy that I see around me just frightens me. And uh, Georgie is not an apathetic person, and she says to her fellow human beings, you know, we are each other's keepers. What we do to each other matters. You know, listen to me, not for the sake of who I am, but for the sake of my message. And um, I think anybody that can deliver a message like that in a very unselfish way you know, deserves to be listened to. And, um, you know, some of the choices in Georgie's life have, have caused people to, you know, turn away simply because of some of the choices that she's made in her life. And I think that's a real silly reason, you know, not to listen to somebody. You know, if I paint myself purple, suddenly does what I have to say become less important than it did an hour ago? She often kids me that I'm uh, her spiritual advisor, well, there's many times that she's my spiritual advisor, so, yeah. I also had a lot of prejudice in terms of, is she a man or is she a woman? And I struggled with that personally in terms of how to present her, how to best enhance her commercially. I mean, they are pulling me off the stage and stoning me or anything. But at the same time, I'm not given the kind of maybe press that I may deserve as a songwriter simply because I don't think they want that image out there of a successful songwriter who happens to be transsexual. Georgie uh, didn't see that as an issue that she needed to bother with. That's one of the long-term disagreements we've had. Uh, but I'd go into clubs who would understand that she was a transgendered person and they would uh, act like being transgendered was a disease that was contagious. And I was, I didn't expect people to welcome Georgie with open arms. I think anytime you have a unique situation like Georgie's, you're going to run into prejudice. But I was shocked at the amount of discrimination uh, I faced in presenting Georgie and that, of course, Georgie faced as being herself. If you happen to be like a, a, a hard rock or a, a garage type band and you're a transsexual and you're wearing corsets and pushing your breast up and, you know, wearing all kinds of makeup and being outrageous, they'll promote you because they want to give people something they can laugh at or something that they can hate. And so the 
the outrageous transsexual provides that so they'll you know they'll put that in a movie or they'll put that on stage or do whatever they need to do with it and then the other image that you see out there is the person that's supposed to be pitied you know the one that oh my god they had to go through all this stuff and do all these things and it is you know it's a hard transitioning is a very hard thing to go through and it does take a lot of work, but you know, it takes a lot of work to be a doctor too, and to be to be a lawyer and to be a great songwriter. And it's did you see him all the time, you know, the Maury show or or Roseanne or when she had a show or, or uh, Oprah or any of them and they have the transsexual on and it's like, oh my god, you know. When I was a little boy. I wanted to play with dolls, and they wouldn't let me play with dolls. <laughs> and, you know, they go on forever about that crap. But here's me, who, I mean, I grew up playing cowboys and Indians. I wrestled, I played football. You know, I did a lot of things that were stereotypical boy activities. And yet, I still felt the way that I felt inside. Now, isn't that much more exciting or maybe that's the wrong word i don't know not exciting but much more of a curiosity thing than the little feminine boy that says i want to play with dolls i mean you know but that's not what you hear on tv i know georgie feels it's a personal attack on him and sometimes maybe it is but probably not always I think also some places are, are afraid. I mean, maybe they're afraid of how it will go over. You know, kind of like um, I was afraid sometimes to take Georgie to certain en environments, thinking thinking that people wouldn't respond to Georgie or or um, or I guess how they would react to Georgie. And, and maybe some places are like that. I mean, I understand there's a place he played in Virginia last year, and I think they they were pretty rude. She had an appearance once in West Virginia. And uh, when it was discovered that there was going to be a transsexual performer appearing at this place, there were death threats. And uh, the show was canceled because the uh, originally, you don't know if that's a serious threat or not, but um, as the job got closer, the uh, county sheriff felt it was a serious threat. They, in fact, did find someone uh, who they thought was ready to shoot the club owner and or Georgie for, I guess, tainting the uh, soil of the fine establishment. Uh, that was somebody that doesn't know Georgie as a person, but just the fact that Georgie has chosen a different path in life than he had thought that was enough reason to hate uh, so Georgie's had experiences like that. The show was canceled, and there's no harm done, except it broke my heart that Georgie had to back down uh, for only being who she is. Musicians have certain expectations and ideas about what they are, and sometimes they're not willing to be flexible enough to uh, work within the bounds of the music business. And I'm not sure that that's good or bad, but uh, it, it does slow one's momentum down. I think Georgie takes it personal, and I think it makes him angry. I mean, Georgie is good. He's a good artist. Nobody can deny that. And I don't understand why he's not playing. I don't understand why his music's not on the radio. I really don't. Every culture has their rituals and their ceremonies and the ceremony or ritual for transgender people who are more on the transsexual end of the scale um, is really surgery you know you can't use the women's bathroom until you've had surgery you can't be addressed formally as a woman until you've had surgery and that's their ritual and that's their ceremonies and laws and the rules that they set up. And so my transition was kind of saying to them, 
this is that strong in my life that I'm willing to go through your ritual to show you how pure my heart is and how sincere my heart is. Do I think that somebody who hasn't had surgery is any less valid than me as, as a woman? Absolutely not. People who are going to uh, make a choice to go through transition uh, essentially are telling the world that uh, instead of being a male, say, they're going to be a female. And uh, although this may be the right personal choice for them, it's, a, it's, it's you know, fraught with many difficulties. Family may desert them, uh, they might not be able to be employed, there is some around the country, uh, decrease in economic uh, potential for people who have transitioned. Um, uh, they may lose friends, uh, you know, they can be teased, uh, there's some violence and, and so forth. So there's, there's many, many obstacles to this uh, course. And in my opinion, it takes a pretty brave person uh, to do that. You know, many of us have difficulty changing our hair or clothing styles, you know, something as mundane as that. And here's a person who's going to change, essentially, um, uh, you know, very uh, dominant uh, thing about them, you know, that they're, they're who they are. I couldn't have pretended for some of the time to have been a man and some of the time to have been a woman. I, I couldn't do it. And this culture defines men who walk around wearing dresses as gay people, gay men, drag queens, or cross-dressers, transvestites. And that isn't who I was. That, it wasn't what I was about. I'm not saying anything that those things are bad or good or whatever. It's just not who I was. And so I kind of defined myself more. And it also became a problem with relationships when I had a male body because ultimately people still relate it to that great holy symbol, the phallic you know, symbol, is even women worship it. I remember when I first met Georgie, he showed me all these videos, like of his wedding and then his bands and his family. And this looked like a very successful person to me who had everything going for them. And and I, after looking at all these videos and pictures, I, I turned to Georgie and I remember saying, you really must have needed to do this because I can't imagine anybody having that much success and taking a gamble on it, which is what you do when you have to go through this kind of transition. You, you take a chance to lose your family, your career, your friends. We know in the literature, you know, that there are instances of where people regret their decisions. People regret things like if they've had uh, surgery, they regret things like the surgery wasn't perfect, you know. Uh, maybe we all do that to a certain extent, but this is pretty massive surgery so that they can feel like, oh, geez, I wish I had better surgery. Um, people come back, I see people come back quite often, and, uh, but it's more around issues in their lives. And the issues in their lives could be complicated by this. For instance, relationships that uh, can be challenged by somebody telling, you know, you meet someone, you fall for them, you tell them, and then you tell them you're transgendered could be challenging in a relationship so we may see you know you may see things of that nature and you know that's what's amazing about Georgie Georgie hasn't lost anybody I mean Georgie still has the same friends and the same family and and when I when I first was with Georgie I used to be worried about going to certain environments I didn't know how people would react to Georgie and I thought that I had to protect him which I didn't because Georgie would go into an environment, any environment, I don't care how conservative, and would win people over. Let's get out to Remy and Don.
met Georgie's brother uh, in a chance encounter in a store, the weird story, but we exchanged email addresses and I got this very strange email address from Georgie's brother 
saying, you might be interested. Um, my brother slash sister is having a house concert. Maybe you would like to come. And that's how I met Georgie. We tend, when we meet people, we tend to be able to dig right under the surface immediately, pretty quickly. And we were able to do that with Georgie. So anybody that you can do that with, I think that there is much room for exploration and there's a lot to explore in a relationship with Georgie. I found Georgie to be rather fascinating. I'd never known anybody who was transgendered before. I didn't have any preconceived notions about gender or being transgendered. Georgie was just a really nice person. And I liked her music and I liked her personality. Mm -hmm. And we just sort of hit it off really well. Uh, the friendships continued uh, for five years. And I go away from this relationship looking at Georgie with great admiration because of the incredible courage that she demonstrates in what she does. You think about the ridicule that people go through in life because they're different. Georgie's very different, and yet she has this great humanity. And she puts herself up on a stage and does her performance and says, this is me. This is, it's here. You just accept me or you don't accept me. And it's not her problem if a person does or does not. It's that person's problem if they can not accept her, but it's certainly not Georgie's problem. That, that's what I like too. I mean, she's saying, accept me for who I am. And we do, and many people do. In, in a society where people are constantly looking for acceptance, that they want to be like other people, you have to admire someone who can stand apart from the pack and say, this is who I am. And who she is is a very wonderful thing. I think there's a great amount of validity in the songs that she writes, in the basic truths that she gets into. Her, her issues about how the Native Americans are treated, were treated, and the history of that that the country denies is very powerful. And she presents it in a very, very powerful way. Uh, the same can be said for her songs that get into the issues of being transgendered, that the songs are full of passion and truth. And that's really what I look for in, in her work, is seeing the basic honesty of it. I, I think one of the key words is passion. I, I think we're, we're drawn to people who have passion for life, and Georgie definitely does. Well, we were, we were in a bar in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, where Georgie was performing. It wasn't a big crowd, and I guess it was like near a holiday. It seems like she always gets booked there, and it's like a holiday season, and the students are out of town. And in the middle of her second set, I think it was, a couple of gay guys walked into the bar. They'd just been to a wedding down the street, and they were a couple. They'd been, they told us they'd been married, sort of, together for 25 years. One of them was very quiet, and the other one was sort of dominant, and was the one who was very interested in Georgie's music and Georgie's appearance. And it was fairly obvious to him that we knew Georgie. And at one point, about 10 minutes into their sitting there, he taps me on the back of the shoulder and points up at Georgie and says, what's with him? I thought about that, and I turned around, you mean, what's with her? Gay guy takes this in, maybe for five or six seconds, comes back with, you mean, so I thought about that and said, mm -hmm. yeah. Gay guy takes this in a couple seconds and says, well, I don't use mine very often, but I would never cut it off. And it was the strangest conversation I'd ever had in a bar. But it also <laughs> occurred to me that this guy totally didn't understand who Georgie was and what Georgie was about, or even the concept of gender identity, despite being a gay person. And, and that struck me as very odd, that you would think that this person would understand a little better. You know, I, I don't have any experience with gender, gender transition myself, but I understand Georgie knows who she is, and she's tried to shape her life to match who she is. And not everybody has the bravery to do that.
but but your discussion in the bar, I think a lot of people confuse gender and sexual preference. They're two different issues. There can be a transgendered person who prefers the same sex, the new sex, or not. And they're two different things. And one thing, I, I can tell you one thing I've learned from my relationship with Georgie is that my preconception of what gender is has changed. The first question when a baby is born, people say, okay, is it a boy or a girl? It's a binary system. It's either this or that. And this has started me thinking that, and, and from my reading also, gender is not a this or a that. It's not binary. There's a whole line. There's a continuum. You think for any female that you know or any male that you know, there is a wide range within each traditional gender. Well, it's the same for all of human nature, I think that there's a continuum and people could be along that line at any particular place. Woman in a man suit is actually about my grandmother, uh, my maternal grandmother, Anna Josephine Blum. She was very, you know, influential on my life in terms of, uh, I think, a lot of the positive things that uh, besides my parents, she was, you know, very much a part of, I think, the good things about me. In 1988, I had a dream in which uh, she came to the house I was living in at the time and took me on a journey and showed me a lot of prophetic things and uh, some ancient things, and in the end bestowed a name on me, which is uh, Donor Lishan, which is the only real important name that I have, and it means beautiful thunder. She's pictured on the back of the album in my grandfather's three-piece suit, and that's where the song title came, Woman in a Man Suit. And, uh, the chorus of it is the woman in the man suit is smiling down on you because uh, in this dream, the message was that I was finally getting my shit together and, uh, you know, finally understanding what I needed to do in my life to move forward. In the spring of 68, the angels drew my grandma. Oh, oh, oh. 
woman in the band suit is smiling down on me. woman in a man suit if I had to narrow it down to one thing is about love and it's um, about um, the love that you get from family the love that you get from connecting to other human beings the love that you give from from yourself um, without ego without um, malice without control um, and the love that it takes to sometimes walk away, uh, the love that it takes to understand that maybe you aren't helping the person that you love enough by being there. So it's really about love, but family is a big important part because I learned so many of those values. I learned so many of those things from my, my grandmother uh, and from my mom and dad. Was I a good kid or a bad kid or? I guess you were a good kid until you got older. Yeah. Then I found out some stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's when I was really old. Well, you were in high school, I guess. Oh, yeah. Last year of high school. Last year of high school. Sneaking out the windows. Yes. That kind of thing. Correct. And I didn't know about it until then. Until mm -hmm. Just a short time ago. Not very, yeah, not very long ago. Yeah. He used to sneak out of the, his bedroom was on the set this level, and he just opened the window, took the screen out, stepped out the window, came back that way. And I was in, Bob and I were in bed sound asleep. And we didn't know about it. And I found it out just a couple years ago. Hmm. I used to do it down Dewey, too. <laughs> when I used to sleep on the side porch, I used to go out the window. And do it. I didn't know that. Yeah. Just finding that out now. Yeah. <clears throat> My father is like, if I had to, like, pick out a human being for another planet to uh, say, well, give us an example of a reason we shouldn't just nuke you all. And I would present my father to, to them and say, this man right here. But Georgie's dad, Chief, was an incredible man. Um, a hard worker, just devoted to his family, devoted to his wife. It, just a great guy. One of the ni nicest people I probably have ever met. Um, their relationship was a little rocky at times because their politics were very, very different. We always had a feud, and, and Mom and I have continued it on since Pop passed, and I come over and I do this, and I do this, which I think is very appropriate, and I do this. Whoop, I do this, which I think is very appropriate. And uh, Mom always comes in, and I come back over, and these are you know, up here or down, you know, down here somewhere, and I gotta find them and put them back up. And, and that's the little game that we play. I know Georgie shared a story with me that when Georgie first started transitioning, apparently his dad caught him in a dress and like slammed him into the mirror and, and said, you're, you're not a woman, look at you, you know, you're a man and you won't wear a dress in my house and told him to get out. And then from what I remember, I think that only lasted a few hours. And then Georgie's dad said, you know, you're my son, I love you and this is your home. The day that he died, everybody was there. We were all around the bed. and. And he died just the way he wanted to, too, by the way. He wanted to be in his wife's arms, and he was. She was holding him. And Georgie was on the other side, up by his head. And then um, I, my understanding is the Lakota have a traditional uh, send-off song, you know, and, and Georgie um, is an honorary Lakota. And he got together with his friend Two Bears, and... Um, and, and and wanted to do a, um, which I think the song is beautiful. I mean, I, I think it's awesome that that culture, they have this tradition. Um, and they got together and did the song. And um, 
There's a prayer in it that it was one of the last prayers his dad said, because his dad always said this very simple prayer before he ate. It still moves me when I hear it. It's like I see a big image of his dad every time I listen to it, his big smile. You know, I got married to Angie. Angie's actually my second wife, ex-wife, you know. Uh, but it was, you know, I, I met her as a woman, legal woman, and, you know, she was in between the lesbian and straight community. And, you know, we decided to get married, so we went down and we got married. And they said that that was an illegal marriage because now I'm a legal woman. And I mean, how is that logical? What is the logic in that? That I can't be, and then are they saying that I can marry, I have to be able to marry a man because that would deny me pursuit of happiness. If they didn't allow me to marry a man, so they have to allow me to marry a man. So what a mind fuck. I mean, that was the perfect case to, to point out how stupid all this shit is. You know, it's two people in love and they come together and they marry. You know, it's a marriage. I don't care if they're male, male, or female, female, or male and female. And of course, the, the right wing is gonna say, oh, well then people are gonna marry their dogs. Well, you know, I love both of my dogs to death. Neither one of them can say, I do to me, or communicate that that's exactly what they mean beyond a shadow of a doubt to me. If they can do that, or if I can do that with them, I'd say, yeah, let marry my dog. Why not? You know? Yes, I believe my political beliefs and uh, passions have hindered me uh, in my success. Um, I know that American Holocaust, which was pretty controversial album was pretty much ignored by the general media and by even the native media because I wasn't native blood. I'm just telling the truth as I interpreted it, I guess, in my life. Georgie's extreme left and I'm more to the right. But um, I think when it comes to the issues that matter, you know, like how people are treated, uh, we agree. You know, we may not agree on all the economical issues. We may not even agree on the war on terror. But when it comes to the welfare of people, of individuals in this country, and even around the world, I think we, we're both humanitarians there, you know? And I respect anybody who has the courage to stand up and say what they really think and what they really believe. And I don't get that. You don't get that with a lot of people. A lot of people say what they think you want to hear. A lot of people want to be popular. Georgie does not care about being popular. Georgie doesn't care if you like what he says. He's going to say it. And Georgie says things that can offend people on both sides. You know? I mean, but at least, at least you know where you stand with Georgie. At least this is an honest, I mean, he's just very honest, very raw. There were all kinds of inspirations. I didn't set out to write an album that was going to piss anybody off or make anybody mad. Those songs just happened because they needed to be written. And I mean, that's my response to people that would want to, you know, tell me that I, I shouldn't be doing that. I should just be entertaining people or, you know, I shouldn't be speaking out about something in a song. There are people in this world that are going to look at a song like Greed from American Holocaust or Devil's Child from Woman in a Man Suit and I'll never be able to convince them that it's not un-American and, you know, that it's not against God in some way, shape, or form. And, you know, I, I'm sorry. Right. I don't think I can let the people that are never going to accept me, I mean, I don't even have to open my mouth and sing and I piss people off. So, I mean, I don't think I can let them rule my life. I can say that if Rush Limbaugh and, and the clown Fox News, whatever his name is, uh, if those guys are happy, there's a good chance that I'm angry and not very happy in the world. The same can be said in the opposite, that if I'm happy with every all the laws that are in place and all the things that are going down and accepted socially, 
they're going to be very unhappy people, and I, I don't have the answer for that. Uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe we should just both grab six guns and walk outside and have a duel and do away with each other. I wish that they could put their rigid, closed-minded way of thinking aside and see the world a little bit the way maybe other people see the world, like me. And I've, I, see, I see where a lot of them are coming from with me, for example. Why would a perfectly normal guy want to be a chick? You know, why would they cut off their neck? Don't make no sense to me. And, you know, I can truly understand why they're saying that. And I empathize with them. The only thing I can tell them is because this is the way it is. This is the truth. And, you know, if you want to put me in prison, it's still the truth. If you want to make laws against me, it's still the truth. If you want to kill me, it's still the truth. I think I'm somebody that believes in truth, and that doesn't mean that I haven't told my share of lies. I don't really have any things that I want to keep secret anymore. My big secret was being transgender and holding that in my life. And, uh, you know, when that was out in the open, there is no big secrets. What you see is what you get. Because if you see him as a, as a he or she, it's Georgie. Listen to the music, listen to the lyrics. I mean, that's what's important. Look how Georgie treats people. Look how Georgie treats his family and his friends. I mean, who cares about this transgender stuff? It's so small. I can't remember how it developed, but uh, I think he turned into a woman at some point. Or maybe it was before that, I don't know. I didn't, you know, I was just a person that I was, you know, it's always flattering when somebody really loves your work and really hears it. Obviously, this person was really hearing it and it meant something to him. An artist can't, I mean, that's the best thing that, aside from the actual creative process of writing and, you know, t taking this stuff and making it into your work, the most uh, gratifying and exciting thing to get is like this the sparkle in someone's eyes when you, who's really heard it, who's really got it, who's really assimilated it. The sparkle in their eyes, the fire in their eyes from your original uh, creation. So, so she really got my attention with that. And then I didn't actually really meet her until, at some point I was playing a, a gig in a Western Mass, and she said, I don't know if we're at email at that point or still doing letters, but she said she's gonna come. So she shows up with some Indian people. And I think she had given me clues about the transgender thing before, so I wasn't surprised. I knew she was a person who was once a man and then turned into a woman. So it wasn't a big shock. Also, I remember before this, she sent me her uh, CD. And I was just blown away about how good it was. I mean, it was like not what I expected, because I get, I'm not famous or anything, but I get like music from people a lot. And I always listen to it, and uh, then she really got my attention because it was good. It was really funky and wild. And uh, I was impressed with it. And uh, I think that's when she really became a person before I even met her. And then she showed up at this gig in uh, Western Mass and played the gig, and I think the next day or, there was a big party, and she showed up at the party, and she was so full of life and so Georgie. <laughs> I just, uh, how can you not love her? Didn't you? Sometimes her passion is, like, overwhelming. It's like, okay, enough passion, I want to drink a beer or, or talk to a stupid person for a while or something. But uh, after I met her, then it was like she was, she was in my life and she had my attention. She was a friend. I think the, um, 
It's special because it's, she's very talented. I like her voice, she's got a great voice. And uh, it's sincere, it's real. In our country, everything is the opposite of what it is. From being in show business and, and seeing people's, the image they project and who they really are has just been really shocking a lot of times. But, but she is a true individual and it's, re it's all real. And, it, and the, the same with, for the music. My success as a musician, as a songwriter, I should probably be satisfied that my songs move people and they've been touched. You know, a lot of people have been touched by my music. For me, I think on a, on a strictly personal, completely personal, selfish level, it would be that I could make my living singing my songs and performing my songs and having other people record and perform my songs. And, you know, I don't need a lot of money to do that. What I love about performing is that I go into this zone where it's it's kind of like um, I'm a big admirer, as you know, of Fool's Crow, and he talks about becoming a hollow, a hollow tube for creator to fill up. And you know he's he you know when he does his healing, you know it's creator that's healing and. You know, he, what he's talking about is basically giving up your ego so that you're not interpreting things and Creator is just filling you up. And while it'll be, I hope I reach that one day in my life, you know, what happens to me on stage is similar to that because I go into this zone where I don't think about being a man or a woman. I don't think about anything really. I just. I do it, I am. I grew up with myself as a male and it's probably just as difficult for me sometimes to understand who I am as a transgender person as it is for people who don't understand transgenderness or people that have known me from the past. As difficult as it uh, for them to refer to you know, Georgie is she. Um, it's maybe not that difficult for me because I took the journey, but I still have, I understand their perspective. And then there's people that, you know, have met me in recent years and this is the only way they know me. And they can't understand the other side. So I'm kind of, I kind of take all that in and I guess I'm a mixture of my surroundings and, um, the family that I grew up in, and the time and the era that I grew up in, um, and still I try to be timeless in what I write and sing about, um, and in my perspective on life. I hope when I'm, you know, my mother's age, that I'm listening to good, soulful songwriters, you know, that have something to say. Maybe I should Could do it with some pills Learn to shoot some heroin I'm sure it packs a thrill And maybe I should run away Would fade into the hills I will go I love this life and all it gives and I love the morning song I love the way the sun shines through my dresses as I sing along another day I find a way
And I fear I'll take those pills But I live I find a way 